Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day today. I hope you're having a wonderful start to your week. In today's video, we are going to be covering an unsolved case. I feel like we haven't spoken about an unsolved case in forever. So today's case is, and there are a lot of theories about what happened to Russell and Shirley Diamond that we're going to talk about. So I'm really excited to hear your thoughts, what theories you believe, if there's maybe a theory you think of while we're talking about the case that I don't mention. I'm so excited to talk to you guys about this one in the comments but before we do I just quickly want to thank today's sponsor June's Journey for making this video possible you may have already heard about them if you have been watching my channel for a while if not I'm so excited to tell you guys about this game because it's so good it's based around a murder mystery you play as June and you have to basically find out who murdered your sister I always play it when I need to take a minute to relax it really helps me just take my mind off whatever I'm doing if I'm stressed like while I'm working or something I always take a minute or two to just play a little June's journey and helps de-stress. It helps take my mind off things and then get back into the mood to work. I know murder mystery doesn't exactly scream relaxing, but you also get to like decorate your own mansion, which is so much fun. And not only do you get to decorate your own spaces, but the levels themselves are actually so beautiful. They're set in the 1920s and you have to go through them and search for all of the clues that provide you with information to continue your investigation into June's sister's death. So it is a lot of fun and I highly recommend you guys check it out. It's just something fun to do. Like if you need a little break at work, a little, you know, five minute break to just de-stress, relax, and then you can get back into it because I swear those little breaks make you more productive or they make me more productive anyway. Or just like on your commute to work, I always play it on the bus. Or if you just want, you know, a little fun game to play in your free time, I will leave the link to download the game in my description down below so you guys can check it out. It is free to play, so highly, highly recommend you guys. It's really good. So like I mentioned today, we're gonna be talking about the case of Russell and Shirley Dermond and this case takes place in May of 2014 in a place called Putnam County, which is in Georgia, which is like kind of close to Atlanta in the United States. At the time that this case took place in 2014, Russell was 88 years old and Shirley was 87. And they were both from New Jersey. They got married in 1950 and had four children together. So they had three sons named Mark, Keith, Bradley. And then they also had a daughter named Leslie. And their four children went on to give them nine grandchildren. During World War II, Russell served in the US Navy and then afterwards he went on to work as an executive for a clock making company and then later went into the fast food business and was in charge of 16 Hardee's restaurants across Atlanta. And Shirley attended Barnard College and after graduating, she ended up staying home to take care of the children. In 1994, Russell and Shirley both retired and together they moved to a gated community called Great Water Reynolds, which was situated on a man-made lake called Lake Oconee. And they lived at 147 Caroline Drive, which is a private home separated from a lot of the others. And it was surrounded by trees. It was a really great place for the newly retired couple to live and just take things slow. It honestly looks so beautiful from the videos I found online but it also seems like there was a lot of people around the same age as them living in the skater community so they were really easily able to socialize and just have a really relaxing retirement. Shirley had her garden, she enjoyed playing bridge and Russell also had his golf but he did eventually have to give that up in his old age. Great Water Reynold also had a really low crime rate as with a lot of these affluent gated communities they had 24 7 security on site and the pair Russell and Shirley were described as a generous and loving couple and they had a lot of friends and family who really cared for them. Unfortunately in the year 2000 they received some really bad news that their son Mark had actually been killed in a drug deal gone wrong and it was actually his 47th birthday. The crime took place in Atlanta and Mark was shot twice and he died on the scene but the perpetrator was actually caught and he was sentenced to life in prison plus 25 years but of course even when a perpetrator goes to jail it doesn't help the pain that the family feels and the whole Derman family was really shaken by this. Besides this incident though nobody else in the family had any ties or connections to any kind of you know crime or drugs or any of that sort of thing. From all accounts Russell and Shirley were really loving people they were really friendly although Russell couldn't play golf anymore he still went on frequent walks and he loved to read and Shirley was still playing 
bridge I think she played like twice a week so people saw them around you know they were still active in their community on the 1st of May in 2014 both Russell and Shirley spoke to their son Bradley on the phone and then after that phone call Russell had some errands to run in the neighboring town of Eatonton and then on the 3rd of May both Russell and Shirley were meant to attend this Kentucky Derby party which was hosted by Huell and Peggy Wynn but neither Russell nor Shirley showed up for this party. A couple days go by, it's the 6th of May and still nobody has heard from them and it's at this point on the 6th that Huell and Peggy become concerned that they haven't heard from them, they didn't show up to their party on the 3rd and then three days later still nothing, they still haven't gotten like a sorry we couldn't come, nothing. So Huell and Peggy decide to go to the Dermans place and check on them but they're not there and they check their mailbox and all of their mail is there from the previous few days they haven't obviously taken any mail out of their mailbox and then you know they walk around the house a little bit and they find that their back door is wide open they go inside looking for them they're calling out for them calling their names but nobody is there they went through each room looking for them you know in case something happened they fell over they're asleep whatever the case may be you know the back door is wide open Open. so they're going through checking every room for them and as they're doing so nothing in the house looks out of place at all and then on the kitchen counter though they find a crossword puzzle from the 2nd of May which has been partially completed it's not finished but they've obviously started on it obviously it's like a little bit concerning but they don't think too much of it until they get to the garage and they find Russell's decapitated body he's lying in a pool of his own own blood and he's in between their two cars that are parked in the garage and there was towels placed all around his body as well which looked like it was an attempt to prevent his blood from leaking out of the garage and alerting people that something was wrong because obviously if there's like blood leaking out of a garage people are gonna check one of the most concerning things when they found his body is that his head was nowhere to be found it was just his body no head and Shirley was also nowhere to be found. And nobody had any idea where she might be either. By all accounts, Russell and Shirley were such lovely people. They were really caring, wouldn't even hurt a fly, you know? So how did they become the center of such a gruesome crime? I mean, where even was Shirley? Who would wanna do something like this? As soon as Peggy and Huell found Russell's body in the garage, they called 911 and 911 responded within minutes of the call and pretty much immediately began their investigation. And they were initially operating under the assumption that Shirley had been kidnapped. They the investigation was being led by Howard Sills from the Putnam County Sheriff's Office and this guy he is a bit of a character but in a good way like he speaks his mind which I love but you can just tell that he is ruthless you know and then the same day that the investigation starts and Russell's body was found the media are already onto this case and they are reporting that Russell has been found dead and that Shirley has been abducted so obviously as the investigation gets underway, the detectives are searching the Dermans house, they're questioning witnesses, just trying to piece together their last moments, get as much information as they can as to why this may have happened. They find that the last time the Dermans were seen alive was on the 1st of May at 4.30 p.m. by the mailman. However, they believe that they could have still been alive on the 2nd of May because there was that semi-completed crossword puzzle found on their kitchen counter. As they searched around the Dermans house they found that nothing had been taken and there were expensive things that if this was a robbery they could have taken like expensive watches that sort of thing so it was pretty clear that this wasn't a robbery it wasn't done for monetary gain and obviously in doing these cases and talking about these cases a lot it's my experience that when nothing has been stolen it's obviously a targeted attack and on top of that Detectives ruled out pretty quickly this having anything to do with their son Mark's death in 2000. Now, because they lived in a gated community, obviously one of the first lines of inquiry was the gate at the front, which was manned by security 24 seven. And it also had CCTV footage. So you would think that if anyone came in and out of this gated community, they would have been caught on CCTV and you would be able to find out if anyone 
out of the ordinary had come into the community. But unbeknownst to everybody who lived in this community, the CCTV was not working. It had been fried a month earlier in a storm, which what are the chances? Like the one time you need the CCTV to be working, it's not. The sheriff even said that there had not been a home invasion in this community for 18 years. So this is literally like the one time they needed it and it's not working and it stopped working just a month prior to the attack. On top of that, like I mentioned, Shirley and Russell's house was kind of secluded. It was surrounded by trees. So there are no neighbors that would have any information or would have seen anything either. Also something to note here is that Russell and Shirley had this like back dock that backed onto a lake. So it's entirely possible that even if the CCTV footage was working, they wouldn't have caught anything because there is the possibility that somebody came through this lake and entered the house through that dock as well. And this was the working theory of the investigators at the time. Because there were no leads as to where Shirley might be, where she may have been taken, who may have taken her, the FBI put up more than 100 billboards. They also offered a $20,000 reward for her safe return. They got got cadaver dogs in to look for her. They had divers sweep the lake looking for her and they even had a remote controlled submersible in this lake, which had a camera attached that they were using to search for her, but none of their efforts turned up any leads. And because she was still missing, there was also the possibility that she was responsible for Russell's murder and then she kind of fled. She wasn't an official suspect, but obviously investigators couldn't rule out this possibility until they figured out what happened to her. Investigators pulled the Dermans' financial records to see if there was any financial motive behind the murder. And also something to note is that Russell actually had almost no injuries on his body, no bruises, no scarring, no stab wounds, nothing besides the decapitated head, obviously. And really at this point, there was nothing. There was no motive, there were no suspects, there was no promising leads, there was literally nothing investigators could find that had them any closer to solving what had happened and where Shirley might be. It wasn't until 10 days later that a fisherman actually discovered Shirley's body. It was in the lake six miles away from their home and it was being weighed down by concrete blocks. And the fisherman who found her body, his name was Dennis Higgins, he actually initially thought it was like, I don't know how you want to say it, a buoy, a boy however you want to say it. That's what he initially thought it was, but then as he got closer, he quickly realized that that was not the case. It was a body. Her cause of death was determined to be two to three blows to the head with a blunt force object, so like a hammer or something similar. Why they decided to dump her body six miles away in the lake is anyone's guess. They really didn't know why, whether it was because you know, they started decapitating Russell and they were like, this is way too much effort. Let's just dump her body. Or maybe it was because they wanted to frame her a little bit. So if she wasn't there, it could have been she was on the run and she was actually the one responsible. Whatever the reason, it's really anyone's guess. But what it did kind of reaffirm for investigators is that this was a targeted attack. Whoever was responsible for this crime knew the Dermans, they knew what they wanted to do and they knew how they were gonna do it and where they were gonna go afterwards. Russell's head still to this day has never been found, but what they did find is gunshot residue on his collar. So this kind of indicated to detectives that he was shot in the head to kill him before they decapitated him. And this could obviously be for a number of reasons. It's easier to decapitate someone when they're dead, I guess, but also because if they shot him in the head and then they go and hide the head where nobody can find it, then detectives can't use the bullet as a method to kind of trace who the killers were, you know, rather than it being just a senseless mutilation. Although I think no matter what way you cut it, it's a pretty senseless mutilation to decapitate somebody. At around the same time that, you know, they found the gunshot residue and kind of were working this out, the Derman's son, Keith, did a TV interview where he said that he believed it could have been the work of a cult, which kind of ties in with the decapitation because it could have been a ritual or something. But this is something that we're going to touch on a little bit later in the video. Putnam County has an interesting relationship with a cult-like group. 
Anyway, back to the investigation, law enforcement at this point are pretty sure that this was the work of an amateur and this is for two main reasons. The first being the gunshot residue that was found on Russell's collar. If law enforcement's theory is correct that Russell was decapitated in order to hide the bullet so that the bullet couldn't be linked to the killer or the killers, then it's likely that the gun was linked to the killer's identity, which is something that a professional wouldn't do. And the second reason is the dumping of Shirley's body. First of all, they don't believe, law enforcement didn't believe that a professional would leave one body there and then dump another body six miles away because they believed that a professional would just come in, kind of kill them both and dump them in the same spot or just leave the bodies in there because they knew that they couldn't be tied to these bodies. And then also just the way that they even dumped Shirley's body, like they just kind of tied her to a couple of cinder blocks and then expected her body not to rise to the surface, which is not something a professional would do because a couple of cinder blocks is not going to stop a decomposing body from rising to the top. It's going to start decomposing and it's going to find a way eventually to rise to the top of the lake or the body of water. Now, another thing that made this investigation hard for detectives is they couldn't determine where Shirley was killed. It could have been at the house, but it could have been anywhere really. And the same goes for Russell because although they found his body in the garage, his head was never found. There was no blood splatter anywhere which decapitating somebody, there would be a lot of blood spatter around. Not from experience, but you know, I just assume that would be messy. And also if investigators are right about him being shot in the head, that would also cause blood spatter, none of which was found inside the house. So this indicated to detectives that he had been shot somewhere else, he had been decapitated somewhere else, and then his body had been placed back inside his house. And another thing that this brought up to investigators is was his body being placed back in the house, just another way for them to distract detectives from Shirley being missing. Maybe she hadn't been killed when they found Russell's body and she was being kept somewhere else at the time. And honestly, if this was the plan, it kind of worked because when they first discovered Russell's body, investigators basically had two investigations going on, who killed Russell and how, and then also where was Shirley? And it seems like the killer or the killers didn't expect Shirley's body to be found as well because you know, they tied cinder blocks to her. They kind of just didn't expect her to float and a fisherman to come across the body. It was basically only because of their sloppy execution of the whole thing that her body was actually found. So as the investigation went on and there was really really no progress that like there was no real leads there was no indicator as to who may have done this they were no closer to solving this investigation and so people started to question why the GBI, which is the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, weren't involved. And the Derman's son, Keith, even was questioning Howard Sills and why he wanted to handle this investigation alone. And I feel like Howard Sills was kind of indicating that the GBI may have been a little bit corrupt, but people really seem to be divided on this issue. Like some people wanted the GBI to be involved and they didn't agree with Howard Sills decision to handle it alone. And then on the other hand, some people were like, yeah, they're probably corrupt and that's probably why. And this also confused me a little bit because from my understanding, the FBI were involved from pretty early on. Like the FBI were the ones who put up the billboards. So I'm not sure why it was like such a big issue that the GBI wasn't involved. I don't know if they just wanted as many people involved as possible or if maybe the FBI was just there trying to find Shirley's body and then once they found her body they weren't as involved I don't know it seems to me like Howard Sills tried to engage the FBI from very early on but he just didn't want the GBI to be involved I don't think he thought it was necessary. Anyway, about 30 days after the murders took place, authorities announced a public reward fund where people from the public could basically donate to this reward fund and it would go towards like rewarding anyone who could give any information that would lead to an arrest. And authorities also kind of used this reward fund as an indicator of people who were close enough to the Dermans to actually make a donation. So they went through the list of people who donated to this fund and just looked for any possible connections, 
to Russell and Shirley and from that any possible motives and the investigation was thorough. So thorough that in the months after the murders took place, investigators had conducted over 200 interviews. As part of these interviews, they also interviewed the Dermans' three children and they all had to undergo polygraph tests and they all passed, so they were all ruled out as suspects. Other than that, there really wasn't a lot of information that was released to the public. Investigators were really keeping their cards close to their chest. Howard Sills did say in an interview at one point that they had found some forensic evidence, but he didn't want to elaborate on that. So we can only really speculate what that evidence may have been. I mean, it may not have even been anything serious. We know that Leslie and her daughter visited Russell and Shirley the week prior to the murders for Easter. So it could have even been their DNA that they found. We just, we really don't know. And other than that, they're didn't seem to be much evidence, there were no suspects, there was no motive. So although the case wasn't cold at this point, it was certainly heading in that direction. I mean, now obviously it's a cold case because it's still unsolved to this day, but there was just all of these little leads that would pop up that turned out to be nothing. So about a year after the murders took place, Howard Sills announced that they did have a person of interest who may have been an ex-employee of Russell who worked at Hardee's, but this turned out to be nothing. And there were just little things like that where a suspect would pop up or a lead would pop up and then actually it's not really a lead. It's not really a suspect, nothing came of it. And so the case eventually went cold and to this day, it is still unsolved. It's been nearly a decade since these murders took place and we're still no closer to figuring out what happened. So really all we have now are theories and that's what we're gonna talk about now. Before we do, I just wanna do like a quick little timeline recap of around about when the actual murders took place. So on the 1st of May, they were still alive at this point. They had a phone call with their son. There's CCTV footage of Russell going about his day, running errands. Shirley also went and played bridge that day at the art center and it was just like a normal day for them. The next day, 2nd of May, we assume that they were still alive for part of this day at least because of the crossword puzzle that was semi-completed on the kitchen table, but nobody saw or heard from either Russell or Shirley on this day. And there are also unread emails on Russell's computer that obviously hadn't been read, hadn't been responded to. And this is out of character for Russell because he's normally super on top of his emails. And then the 3rd of May, they were meant to attend a Kentucky Derby party with their friends, but they didn't show up. So we can assume from this information that they were murdered sometime on the 2nd of May. But that is really all of the evidence. So we can't confirm that they were murdered on the 2nd of May or the 1st of May or when this case actually took place. We can only assume assume based on the circumstantial evidence and the little evidence that we do have that it took place on the 2nd of May. So the first theory is that this was a robbery gone wrong. As I mentioned, I find this to be pretty unlikely because there were valuables inside the house that hadn't been taken, like expensive watches, that sort of thing. And if it was a robbery, you would think that they would take some of the stuff for the house. However, Howard Sills believes that it is possible that Shirley was taken for ransom and when Russell couldn't pay the money, they murdered him. It might not have even been money that they were after. They were just, you know, for whatever reason, they were trying to extort the Dermans and did this by abducting Shirley. And for whatever reason, they didn't get what they were looking for. And so they ended up murdering both Russell and Shirley. Another possible theory is that this was a disgruntled employee. As I mentioned, the Dermans owned 16 different Hardy's restaurants. So they dealt with a lot of employees, a lot of customers. And in this case, it really seems like whoever the perpetrators were definitely knew the Dermans. There are a number of reasons why an employee could be disgruntled, whether they were you know, fired for a reason that they didn't think was fair or whatever the case may be. But there's just no evidence to suggest that there was an employee that was like this angry. As I mentioned about a year after the murders took place, Howard Sills did come out and say that they had a possible suspect who may have been an ex-employee who may have had some hard feelings towards the Diamonds, but this didn't turn out to be anything. But who knows? Maybe they were on the right track. I couldn't find anything. about 
anything going wrong with any employees, any reasons why any employees would be angry at the Dermans. There was also another theory that it was a case of mistaken identity, but I do find this to be unlikely because it was in a gated community. Everyone in this community knows everyone. So you would think that you would wanna make sure that you have the right house. And their house was like, as I mentioned, kind of secluded to the point where there were no neighbors who would have seen anything that happened. So it seems hard to have targeted their wrong house as the wrong house, if that makes sense. And also if it is a case of mistaken identity, like who is going around killing someone and they don't even know what they look like, you know what I mean? So I feel like that's unlikely. Another theory that I read about is that it was potentially just a senseless act of violence. Obviously they lived in an affluent gated community. So it's not a far-fetched assumption to assume that they have money. Not to mention their house, as we mentioned, was on the lake. So you could bypass the CCTV. I know the CCTV wasn't working, but it looked like it was working. And you know, as a killer, you don't really want to go through that CCTV. You want to bypass it. So it was easy to bypass past all of that CCTV and get to their house because they were right on the lake. So you could enter through the lake to get to their house. They were kind of an easy target if you wanted to get to this, to get to somebody from this gated community where people obviously have a bit of money. And they could have just knocked on the door and pretended that they were somebody from the gated community, that they were some sort of worker. And Shirley and Russell were described as these really lovely people. So they could have opened the door to have a chat with them. And these killers could have just barged right in. The only thing that doesn't really make sense about this theory is it's assumed that the perpetrators knew who Russell and Shirley were and that this was a specific targeted attack based on all of the circumstantial evidence that they do have. And also the fact that investigators don't believe that Russell and Shirley were murdered at their house. They were taken away and then Russell's body was kind of placed back in the garage because there was no blood spatter, nothing. So if it was just a senseless act of violence, it doesn't make sense that they would take them away and then bring them back to the house and especially doing all of that undetected. But you know, it's not out of the question. There are shitty people in this world who will just target old people because they think that they have money and they don't care. They don't feel bad. Some people do not have a conscience at all. One of the more out there theories is that Russell was connected to the mafia. He was from New Jersey. You know, people said he may have had some connections to some underground dealings. Personally, I feel like this one is a bit far-fetched. I feel like whenever there is an unsolved case, people always jump to the mafia for some reason. I don't know what it is, but people are always like, you know what, we don't know who did this, so it must have been the mafia. Or the cartel, um, which people also speculated that this may have been the cartel and that they murdered Russell and Shirley to send a message. Not sure who this message is aimed at. I feel like people just came up with this theory because there was no other theories that are making sense at this point. So people's imaginations are just running wild. The only like known connection they had to any sort of crime or drugs was their son, Mark, who was murdered like 14 years before this happened. And you may be thinking if he was involved, maybe some of the other kids were involved, but there seems to be no connection. And if they were going to kind of send a message to one of the kids, why wouldn't they send a message to the kids' kids or like any of the other siblings? Like why would they just murder their elderly parents? Also, if it was the cartel or the mafia, I feel like they wouldn't be stupid enough to have or to use a gun that would be connected to that identity in any way, which is what investigators are assuming happened because that's why they decapitated him so that, you know, they couldn't connect the bullet to anyone. And if it was the mafia and the cartel and they did for some reason do that and decapitate him so that they couldn't find the bullet, I feel like they wouldn't be stupid enough to leave like some gunpowder residue on the collar. This is the cartel and the mafia. Like they know how to murder somebody. I feel like they also would have disposed of Shirley's body a bit better so that it would never be found. It just doesn't seem to be the case. There's like no evidence whatsoever to suggest that that is the case. Investigators also went through the Dermans' financial records to see if there was anything that could lead them to any motives or any persons of interest. And there was nothing. There was nothing weird about their financial records at all. And from all accounts, Russell and Shirley were just like these lovely, regular 
people, like going to play bridge twice a week, going on walks, like just wholesome people who had no reason for anybody to want to hurt them. So it just doesn't really make sense. This next theory is pretty far-fetched, but it actually goes really deep. Like I feel like I could almost do an entire video just on this theory, but it's basically about this group which is basically a cult called the Nuwabian Nation. They were founded in 1967 by this guy named Dwight York. And by the year 2000, they had amassed over 500 supporters, all of whom saw Dwight as like this godlike figure. And they had also moved, the Nuwabian Nation had moved from upstate New York to Eatonton, which is right where the Dermans were based. Anyway, in 2004, the Nuwabian Nation's supporter base fell, dropped drastically because their leader, Dwight York, was sentenced to 135 years in prison for child molestation, sex trafficking minors, racketeering, and financial reporting charges. So just a great guy all around, as all cult leaders normally are. Despite him, first of all, being the worst human being ever and being sentenced to 135 years in prison, there was still quite a significant amount of loyal followers who stayed in Putnam County despite the fact that the compound they built was demolished and sold and they were loyal. And when I say loyal, I mean loyal. Now what ties the Nuwabian nation to the Dermans is the fact that the person who kind of uncovered Dwight York being a sick freak was actually none other than Putnam County Sheriff Howard Sills. And there was also a lot of tension in Putnam County, like Putnam County residents versus the Nuwabians because obviously their supposed God was now in jail and so the Nuwabians were mad and people also thought they were weird because it's just kind of a weird thing to follow a guy who is so disgusting and you're still like blindly supporting his cause so obviously people were like ew you know so there is some speculation that because the Nuwabians were so mad about all of this contention, about the fact that people didn't like them, about the fact that their god like got locked up, and so they potentially took their anger out on the community and specifically Howard and Shirley. Maybe he did this to try and get at Howard Sills for locking their god up. The Nuwabians were also responsible for two other murders that occurred in 2014. So it wasn't a huge stretch to think that they may have also been responsible for the murders of Shirley and Russell Dermond. I don't know why specifically they would target Shirley and Russell Dermond if it was the Nuwabians because I mean, unless they're just trying to target two people who seem like really good people and they think it'll cause a bit of a stir. But in saying that, it was never connected really to the Nuwabians. Like this is just a theory. So I don't really know how it kind of, what they would even gain out of it. Besides, I don't know, maybe making the community mad. I don't know. It doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. I feel like if they wanted to go after Howard Sills and make him angry, then they would just murder somebody close to him, you know? Maybe that's why Howard didn't want the GBI involved because he didn't want the GBI to be able to connect him to the reason people have been murdered. I don't know. Feels a bit far-fetched to me. Like I really don't think this is the case, but you know, when there are unsolved murders that happen, people will try and come up with any theory to justify it and feel some sort of closure. And I think on top of that, the fact that no theories really make sense. Like for me, I don't think there's a single theory that I'm like, yeah, that's definitely who killed them, you know? And so I feel like a lot of people probably feel that same way. So people are just like grasping at straws, trying to find any explanation as to why this might have happened. There are some theories, like other than the New Arbian Nation, there are some theories that Howard Sills was somehow involved and that's why he didn't want the GBI involved because he didn't want them to get too close to discovering the truth. I don't know. I don't know what motive he would possibly have to be involved in the murder of these two people. Sheriff Sills himself believes that at least two people were involved in these murders. 
and he believes that whoever these people are, they were known to the Dermans. He also hasn't given up hope on this case. Apparently, even, you know, today, nine years later, they're still finding new information. Just last year, there was new evidence that was introduced to the case. They found some new cell phone data, which they've turned over to the FBI to have analyzed, but I don't think anything has come of this yet. Personally, there are no specific theories that I believe. There's no theory that I have looked into that I'm like, yeah, a hundred percent. That's what happened. Like there's not a single one. Based on this information, it seems to me like whoever the perpetrators were, they came via the lake, they kidnapped both Russell and Shirley at gunpoint and murdered them in a different location. And then they returned Russell to the house, to the garage. Other than that though, that's, there's no information in this case. There's no evidence, no information, no suspects, no possible motive. Like there really is no information, no leads in this case. So it really feels like this case is not gonna be solved because in nine years, there's been nothing, which is so incredibly sad for Russell and Shirley's family. I cannot even imagine what they would be going through. I cannot imagine the fact that their parents, their grandparents have been murdered in such a senseless way. They seemed like such lovely, you know, wholesome people. And there is just no closure, no sense of justice. I know you can never really have closure from this sort of thing, but it's almost worse not knowing and it's worse not having that justice. Whoever did this is still out there and that's the worst part. Anyone who does have any information, no matter how big or small you think it may be, is encouraged to call the Putnam County Sheriff's Office. I will leave the phone number in the description down below if somehow someone happens to see this who may know the tiniest detail. But that's everything. That's everything from me today. That's all from this case. I would love to discuss your thoughts and your theories in the comments down below if there are some theories you thought of that I didn't mention because this is truly a crazy one. Like I cannot think of what kind of a person would just senselessly murder these two people who were just living their lives in their retirement just like ordinary lives, going and playing bridge, hanging out with their friends, going on walks. Like it just seemed like such a wholesome life. They were such sweet people and it just seems so senseless. But that's all from me today, guys. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.